Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Rock. Come on, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. You know, listen, you never go to church to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old. Uh, you know what? We have a great teaching team here at The Rock, Pastor Jim, Pastor Luke, Pastor Deborah. Uh, you know, I'm privileged to be a part of that as well. But listen, it's not about any of us. It's about us coming together and hearing from the voice of God, inviting the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher and be our guide. So let's go before the Lord. Let's prepare our hearts in prayer, and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher tonight. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise that we get to come into your house tonight, God. Lord, what a privilege and an honor to be hosted by your presence as well as to host your presence, Father. Thank you for coming and blessing us tonight. Thank you for the encouragements and, and the building, the edification that already has taken place in this church service. God, we don't want to stop there, Lord. We want to go further and farther with you, God. We want to come and open up your word and learn and Father, I pray that you build and strengthen your church tonight with the word of God that goes forth. I pray that as we open up your word tonight, that you would open us up to receive it, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing for ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, we love them, and at no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anyone, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, Lord. Father, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated tonight. Get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis chapter number 11 to start. But before we get there, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you to do something for me, okay? I want you to just think of something in your mind. I don't want you to shout it out or, or, or tell anybody next to you. I just want you to think of a number in your mind, okay? Pick a number, any, any number, just whatever comes to your mind right now. And I want you to just hold on to that number in your thinking right now, okay? Don't tell anybody. Don't shout it out or anything like that, okay? Everybody got their number? Okay, anybody need more time? All right, good. Now, how many of you, your number, by a showing of hands, just, just by raising your hand, how many of you, your number was under 100? Take a good look around. Take a good look around. Okay, keep your hands up. It's okay. Take a good look around. Your number was under 100. How, okay, hands down. How many of you, your number was over 1,000? Okay, a couple of you guys out. How many of you, your number was over 1 million? Okay, let me see. Any, any hands? Wave them at me if your number was one right there. Anybody else, your number was over a million? Okay, one person. One person. Now, let me ask you another question. Why is that? Why do we pick numbers that are so small? In thinking about this, I was studying, and I found a neat little illustration of this. In 1998, Larry Page and Sergey Brin incorporated a company named Google while still graduate students at Stanford University. Now, according to Fortune Small Business Magazine, internet users performed over 150 million searches a day on the Google internet search engine. The Google search engine can access over 2 billion pages in 74 different languages. And one study showed that the Google users used the search engine 13 million hours in one month. Now, compare that with Yahoo, which came in second with 5.4 million hours. That's quite a spread. Now, how did they get so big? Now, I don't have the expertise to tell you that, nor do we have the time to answer that question tonight, but I can tell you that most likely it began with their initial vision. See, the word Google is a mathematical term for a number one followed by 100 zeros. See, the creators of Google picked a number, but they didn't pick one through 100, or even 1,000, or even a million. No, they picked the number one with 100 zeros behind it. Tonight, I want to talk to you about living bigger for the Lord. Living bigger for the Lord. See, the earth system, the God of this world, lowercase g, as the Bible calls him, the devil, would love us to live a small life, a small, ineffective, boring mundane life where the only legacy we leave is on a gravestone somewhere in a field. That's the kind of life that the world system 
and the God of this world, lowercase g, would like us to live. But God has a life for you and I that's bigger than anything that we could ever imagine. And God wants us, when we leave this planet, to leave a mark for Jesus Christ. God doesn't want us just to leave. And listen, it's not about people knowing our name. It's not about us building an empire or any of that kind of stuff. No, it's about us building the kingdom of God. And so if we're going to do that, we've got to start thinking bigger. We can't stay with just the world-sized thoughts or the thoughts that we were raised with or the thoughts of the education system, the thoughts of television and media. See, all of that is small thinking because all of that is, is, is earth-side and it's planetary, and yet we have a God who is a God of the universe that wants to expand us, wants to build us, wants to grow us, and wants to get us into new arenas of life. And if we're going to live bigger for the Lord, we've got to start thinking bigger. Why? Because our thoughts turn into our words and our attitudes and our actions. And so it all starts with our thought process. You've heard this, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so as we start to learn how to live bigger for the Lord, it starts with how we think. Now, why don't we think bigger? Okay, that's the initial question that has to be asked. It's begging to be asked, why don't we think bigger? Why did we pick number two? Why did we pick number six? Why didn't we pick the millions? Why didn't we go for it? Why, why, why don't we dare to dream? Well, one reason I came up with is that we're not thinking. Why don't we think bigger? We're plain and simple not thinking. We're allowing other people to think for us. We want the government to think for us. We want our educators to think for us. You want your pastors to think for you. Everybody else, go ahead, think for me. Tell me how to do it. And I'll just do it. We're not thinking for ourselves. But if we never ask the right questions or challenge the status quo, then we're just responding to life, floating through, allowing things to happen, and never being an influence. Are you listening tonight? So, number one, we're we're probably not thinking. How about this one? Laziness. Can I tell you something? Pastor Dan is guilty of this one. There are times where I don't want to think. There are times when it hurts to think. I've thought enough. I don't want to think anymore. I want to veg. And, and, and I get into this slump, you know. And maybe that's part of this, is that maybe it's easier not to think. Maybe it's easier to think small. Oh, I'll, I'll think, but I'll, I'll just stay right here where it's manageable. There's less responsibility. I, I don't have to be accountable. I, I, it's not hard on me. I, I, I can do my thing and my time and my way. And so I'll stay small so that I don't have to go through the pain of getting big. Could it be that laziness has stopped us, halted us? And that goes along with apathy and lethargy. Hmm. So why aren't we thinking bigger? Well, here's another reason. Disappointment. I tried to think big, and it didn't happen. And so I got disappointed, and now I'm afraid to think big. Well, let me ask you this question, child. When... Did God ever give you permission to operate in fear? Did God ever show up on the scene in the Bible and say, be afraid? No. What happens when an angel shows up or when Jesus shows up in the middle of a room that's locked doors and a bunch of people standing around? What's the very first thing that they say? Fear not. Why? Because something larger just entered the room. Something greater just came on the scene. And Earthside, it's difficult. We've been disappointed. See, the disciples were all disappointed because they thought Jesus was coming with power and with an army and with angels and was going to set up a new government system. Even after the resurrection, they asked him, when is it going to happen? Jesus says, "Not, not for you to know the times of the season. Just know this, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that you will receive power from on high. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost ends of the earth. What is he doing? He's expanding their thinking. Get off of this, guys. It's going to happen in the appointed time, in the appointed season. But right now, the power of the Holy Spirit's coming on you. And you've got a world to take for Jesus Christ. Wow. But the disciples were disappointed because they didn't see a military leader, a government leader, a world leader as being one that would hang on a cross. 
You're there in Genesis chapter number 11, disappointment, talking about disappointment. Genesis chapter number 11. In fact, if you find Genesis 12 and back up a couple verses, we're going to be Genesis chapter 11, verse 27 through verse 32. Last couple of verses there in Genesis chapter number 11. Introduce you to a person by the name of Terah. Now, most of us don't know who Terah is, but as we read, we'll find out who he is. Genesis chapter number 11, verse number 27 says this. It says, this is the genealogy of Terah. In other words, this man is so important that we're going to get a record of his lineage in the Bible. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram. Now, there's a man we know. We know Abram. Why? Because Abram became Abraham, who is the father of faith to all who believe, right? This was a great man. This was a, a, a man that God called friend. This was a man that God said, am I going to go and do something without first telling Abraham? I mean, this was a great man. And so here is this great man's father, Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. Now, we know Lot, right? Lot is the guy that, you know, him and Abram, he was Abram's nephew. Abram took him with him. And their flocks and their herds increased so great that the land couldn't support them. He chooses the way towards Sodom, ends up in some trouble, right? Has to flee Sodom. And there his wife turns into a pillar of salt. We know Lot's. So we know Abram, we know Lot, now we know Lot's granddaddy and Abram's daddy, uh, Terah, right? Verse 28, and Haran, that was one of Terah's sons, and Haran died before his father. That's a disappointment. Any parent who's lost a child can tell you that's devastating. That's something that you don't just get over. It's a hurt, it's a, it's a loss, it's a disappointment. Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Verse 29. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. Verse number 30. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. 31. And Terah. Here we are back to this man, Terah. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. We just read this verse. Where are they going? Can you tell me? Okay, about six or seven of you guys are paying attention right now. It's very important that you get a hold of this. I need you guys to think, okay, because we're talking about thinking bigger, right? So I need you to start thinking now, and it may hurt, and I understand you've had busy, long days at you know, work and all that kind of stuff, but, but I, I need you to get this, okay? Because if you don't get a hold of this, you will stop at disappointment. And I'm going to show you this in the scripture in a second. They went out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. Where were they going? Canaan. Okay, where were they going, everybody? Canaan. They were going to Canaan. And they came to Haran. Now, that's the name of his dead son, right? But there was also a city by the same name. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. What does that mean? They were headed to Haran? No, you just shouted it. Where were they headed? Canaan. Canaan. But they came to Haran, the name of the place that bears the name of his dead son, and they dwelt there. They stopped there. They lived there. They stayed there. They dwelt there. Verse 32, so the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. In other words, he never made it to his destination. Why? Because he didn't get over the disappointment. He stopped. He stayed there and he died there. Abram went on. Abram had a call of God in Ur to go to the land of Canaan, that God was going to give it to him. God called him out of that land. Terah was a part of that. Terah was moving in the direction of the plan of God, and yet there was a disappointment in his life, and when he faced it, when he came to the city that bared the name of his dead son, he stopped there, he stayed there, and he died there, never getting to his destination. Why don't we think bigger? Probably because we've been disappointed at one time or another. I believed God for healing, and it didn't happen. I believed God for, for finances and provision and, and prosperity, and, and it didn't happen. I, I believed God for a successful marriage, and it didn't happen. I believed God for my kids to serve them, and it didn't happen. And so I'm afraid to think big, and yet God is saying, be not afraid nor dismayed, church. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You can be strong and of good courage. Why? Because the Lord your God is with you. 
God is on your side. And just because things don't work out the way that you want them to work out doesn't make God any less God and the ability of God any less ability and strength. And the power of God is not sapped because we had a bump in the road, because we had a disappointment, because we had something that we couldn't get over. Listen, you can get over it with the power of God. You may never get over it, but you may get through it by the power of the living God. Why don't we think bigger? We're either not thinking, maybe we're lazy, maybe we're just disappointed. So then the next question is, how can we think bigger? How can we think bigger? If the point is to start thinking bigger so that our, our attitudes are bigger and our, and our words are bigger and then our actions are bigger, if that's the point, to live bigger for Jesus Christ, then how do we think bigger? How do we get started on this thing? Well, first thing I want to give to you tonight is you got to get vision. If you're going to think bigger, you're going to have to start to see bigger. You're going to have to get a hold of it here first so that on the inside, you're going to have to see it, see something larger. So how do you do that? Well... Get into God's Word. Start to get that vision. Read God's Word. Get a vision of what it is that God has for your life. See, if you stay with the little thinking of the world, see, there's something called the American dream. Own a house, have a family, 2.4 kids. I don't even know how you have 0.4 kids. Cat and a dog, white picket fence, live a good life. Life where you don't make too many waves, nice to your neighbors, that's the American dream. Food on the table, right? That's the American dream. Many people have, have lived a bigger life because of the American dream. But listen, I'm here to tell you that the American dream pales in comparison to the God dream on the inside of you. You can have the American dream, and that's okay, that's cool. But when you get the God dream, now all of a sudden, that's much bigger. Why? Because it goes into eternity. It has eternal significance. It has eternal value. It impacts more than just you. It impacts those around you. And God wants you to have a God dream, to get a vision. So get into God's word. Start to find out what's pleasing to the Lord. Start to find out what the will of God is. Start to find out how God wants you to live your life. Start to find out how God wants you to think, how God wants you to act, how God wants you to talk. Get into the word of God. Pray. Get into the face of God. Start to talk to God. Start to get a vision. God, what is your vision for my life? God, show me the picture. Show me the, the vista, God. Take me up to the heights. I don't know if you've been up to the mountains lately. Well, when you get up into a place of something that's bigger than yourself, it takes your breath away. Now, all of a sudden, that small thinking starts to go away. Why? Because now you get a picture of something much greater. It can be overwhelming at times, but still, there's an awe, there's a respect, there's a grace. There's, there's something that goes along with it. When you start to view things bigger than yourself, you start to take a look at things that are larger than you. My goodness, it does something on the inside of your heart. Go with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms 121. You guys here tonight? Praise the Lord. While you're turning to Psalm 121, turn to somebody and tell them, this is good for you. Tell someone else, actually, it's good for me. Psalm 121, are you there? Psalm 121, we're going to read verse 1 and verse 2. Psalm 121, verse 1, says this. says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. In other words, I want you to get a picture of this. I will lift up my eyes. That means that his, his, his eyes, his vision was small because his eyes were down. When your eyes are down, all you get is this. So he says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. What is that? That's something larger than himself. The hills are higher than himself. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? Or some translation says, from where did my help come from? Where does my help come from? In other words, I was here focused on this. Now I'm here focused on something bigger than myself. And all of a sudden, my vision started to expand. And I asked the question, where does my help come from? Does it come from something here on earth? But because he got a bigger vision, look at the next verse. Verse 2. My help comes from the Lord, who made not just the hills, who made not just this expanse, who made not just this stuff that's bigger than me, who made heaven and earth. 
See, he was here. It was little, it was small, it was this picture right here. And then he started to lift up his eyes to the hills. And as he was looking to the hills, he got a bigger vision than himself. And he said, where does my help come from? Does it come from the hills? Does it come from this great thing? Does it come from... No, where does my help come from? Well, my help goes above the hills. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And listen to this, church. If God be for you, who can be against you? If God is on your side, what can man do to you? The Lord is your helper. You shall not want. That's the God that you got on your side. See, the Lord is your help. Don't look to man. Don't look to a paycheck. Don't look to a business. Don't look to a person. Don't look to, a, don't look to any of that stuff. Look to the Lord who made heaven and earth. If God can create the heavens and the earth, God can take care of your life and your situation. So how, how, how can we think bigger? Number one, get vision. Get vision. Start to look at things bigger than yourself. Start to expand that vision. Second thing is get faith. You got to get faith in your life. You got to believe God for something. If you're going to start to think bigger, you got to start to believe bigger. You got to have faith for bigger thinking. You got to have faith. Why? Because it's scary. My goodness, you start getting that big vision. You start to get, see something big. Like I said, it can be overwhelming. But with faith, now all of a sudden you've got the answer. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a hold of it. Why? Because nothing's impossible to him who believes. Why? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. See, God wants us to be a people of faith, so when we start to see, now we can start to believe. So if we're going to think bigger, we've got to get faith. Romans 10, chapter, Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. Turn there with me in the New Testament. Book of Romans, chapter 10. Very familiar verse when it comes to faith. Romans chapter number 10, verse number 17. If you know it by heart, quote it with me. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's say it again together if you got it in your Bible or it's up on the overhead. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, why did I have you say that? Because you just heard yourself speak the word of God. And if you're going to get faith in your life, it's time to start speaking the word of God. And as you speak the word of God, you'll get faith. And as you build faith, you can believe God for his word and you will receive the promises. That's the way this works. So if you're going to start thinking bigger, if you're going to start believing God for more, now you've got to start speaking faith. You've got to start getting into the word of God. That's why you come to church. Why? So that you can hear the word of God. If you're not hearing the word of God, then go somewhere where they're preaching the word of God. That's why every time we come together in this church, we're going to open up a Bible. Not going to open up our internet. Not going to open up O Magazine. Not going to open up Reader's Digest. We're going to open up the Bible. So bring your Bible. Bring your smartphone with your Bible app. That's cool too. But make sure you're not on Twitter and Facebook and everything else. Why? Because then there's other voices coming and you've got to focus on the Word. Take some notes. My goodness, that's what this is all about. Listen. Get faith. How about this? Get around people of faith. What does that mean? See, if you get around people of fear, the Bible says you will become what you hang around with. That bad company corrupts good character. And that a companion of the wise will himself become wise, but a companion of fools will himself come to ruin. So if you're going to get faith, get into the word of God, get into church, Listen to the word of God, but also get around people of faith. Why? Because they talk different than we talk. Why? Because they think different than we think. If you've been in this church for any period of time, you know that our senior pastor, Pastor Jim and Deborah, they are people of faith. They breathe faith. It comes out of their pores. You can't get around them without getting encouraged. You can't get around them without them speaking faith into your life. You can do it. You're, you're, you're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You're a child of God. You've got the king and his kingdom on the inside. You can do it. See, that's why we hang around people of faith. Why? Because we're built in faith. 
And then as we're built in faith, we start to pour into them what they poured into us, right? And, and now all of a sudden, there's this synergy and there's this momentum. And all of a sudden, when you've got faith-filled friends and people, when you go to them with this big vision, they don't say, nah, you can't do it. You're too stupid. You don't have enough money. You're ugly and nobody likes you. No, they don't say that at all. What do they say? They say, you can do it. You're the best, man. That's a God-sized vision, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to pray for you. I I'm going to encourage you. I'll do what I can. That's why we get around people of faith. Why? Because all of a sudden, there's this catalyst. There's this energy. That's why we encourage people to serve in a ministry or to get into a small group or get in some sort of godly relationships. At least find out the name of the person who's sitting next to you. Why? Because you all sit in the same spot anyways. Don't think we don't know. If we ever wonder, is somebody in church? We say, okay, this coming Wednesday night, they're on the right side over behind, you know, and we, and we know exactly where you're at. If they're not sitting there, they're not here. We're creatures of habit. So find the faith-filled friends around you. At least come a little bit early. Start talking to people next to you. Find out what's going on. Find out their name. Find out, hey, how did you come to this church? That question alone, you'll have a lifelong friend right after that question. Because you'll be like, man, listen to how I came. So all of a sudden, you're talking. All of a sudden, you're, I, and I got saved, and I believe in God. And all of a sudden, what's happening? You're speaking the word, and you're speaking encouragement. You're speaking faith once again. And you're mutually encouraged. How can we think bigger? Number one, get vision. Number two, get faith. Number three, this is the most important one. Get God. Most important, above all else, get God. If you're going to think bigger, grab a hold of God. Why? Because God is a big God. God is bigger than we can comprehend. And the bigger the God is on the inside of you, the bigger your image of God, the bigger your vision of God, the smaller everything else is in comparison. When you take a look at your problems, your problems may look like a mountain to you. But can I, can I suggest something to you? You're looking like this, and you're seeing this mountain. But when you start to lift up your eyes and get a bigger vision and start to get faith, and you get a hold of the God who is your help, now all of a sudden, you look back at your problems, and you say, I was worried about what? Is that all? Oh, come on, devil. You're under my feet. Oh, what, what, what can separate me from the love of God? What, what, what is it that's going to hold me back? See, even if the world is coming against you, the Bible says this is that which has overcome the world, our faith. So the world in comparison to God, listen, the earth is God's footstool. That means he kicks back on his lazy boy and puts his feet up on the earth. Am I talking to anybody tonight? See, when you get a hold of God, now all of a sudden, it doesn't matter. Go, bring hell or high water, I will pass through it all. That's the confession of somebody who's got God. That's the confession of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were facing a wicked king who was about to throw them in a furnace and barbecue them to a crisp. They said, listen, even if God doesn't save us, we're not bowing. But he's going to save us. See, they had faith. They believed God, and they had God on the inside of them. That's why Daniel stood up to the king and said, I'm not going to eat your stuff. Uh, uh, just test us. God will take care of us. Well, see, it didn't matter the problem that came against these guys. Why they had God on the inside. And anytime there's pressure, think about a balloon. A balloon will pop when the pressure on the outside is greater than what's on the inside. So that means whatever you're filled up with, if you're filled up with fear, frustration, doubt, worry, anxiety... See, that, that's, that's very small. That, that, that's, that's an internal pressure that will eventually cave in and you will implode and you will pop. But when you get God on the inside of you, now God is the greater one and see, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That means the pressure that's on the inside of me, God pushing out, God reaching out, God on the inside now is greater than the pressure on the outside of me and nothing can make me pop. Doesn't matter how many times you try and poke at me and, and prod me and, and, and swipe at me and whatever you throw at me. See, it doesn't matter why, because I've got God on the inside. I am wall to wall, Holy Spirit. So if we're gonna think bigger, we gotta get God. 
Got to get a hold of God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Again, very familiar scriptures. But we, we quote these things and we, and we say these things without any power behind it. But take a look at what it says. If he, I'm sorry, Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13. Quote it with me if you can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One more time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say it like you mean it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, Christ is on the inside of you. He's the one living on the inside of you now. And Jesus Christ empowers you so that it doesn't matter what situation you're facing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me ask you a question. Do you know what all things means? All things. That's right. And the context of this verse is in the middle of financial adversity where Paul was talking about a need and suffering loss and, and, and learning what it means to abound as well as to be abased. See, some of you have an abundance. But listen, you won't last very long if you don't know how to handle the blessings and the abundance. But you can do it through Jesus Christ. Some of you are in lack and in poverty. And you don't know how you're going to make it. You're living paycheck to paycheck or you wish you had a paycheck. Hello. But listen, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can do it. It doesn't matter what walk of life you're from, what cultural background you're from, what economic or social economic background you're from. Does not matter one bit. Doesn't make a bit of difference. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How about this one? I'll just pop it up on the overhead for you. Matthew chapter number 19. Verse number 26. See, and, and, and if you don't know these references, I would encourage you to go there in your Bible. Turn there in your Bible. Mark it in your Bible. Uh, highlight it or, or write it down. Do whatever you need to do to get a hold of these things. Because I'll tell you, life is coming. Tonight, when you get to your car, life is coming. It will slap you in the face. It has a way of waking you up. And yes, you are in the glory cloud right now. Yes, preach it, amen, pastor. But the moment you get out to your car and something happens, someone says something, so you're driving on the freeway and somebody waves hello with one finger or whatever happens to you when you get out of this place, you're going to have to deal with life and therefore you're going to have to have the word of God. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 26, but Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. See, if you've got a hold of men, if that's what you've got, if you're relying on a person, or a personality, or a world system, it's impossible. Not going to work. Not going to make it. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I'll try this side over here. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. They, they got it. Pick another number. Again, don't tell anybody. Here's the question, though. How many people, how many people do you think you'll influence in your lifetime? Don't tell anybody. How many people in your lifetime do you think you'll influence? Blew me away the first time I heard this. A guy by the name of Dr. Tim Elmore, he says that the most introverted person, you know what an introvert is? Somebody who's, you know, doesn't like to be outgoing. They're an introvert. They're not an extrovert. You know, they're, they're internal. They internalize things. They don't really talk a lot. So the most introverted person in their lifetime will influence 10,000 people. Now, I don't know what number you picked. I'm not going to ask for a showing of hands on this one. But the most introverted person, according to this guy, will influence 10,000 people. If you lived an 80-year lifespan, that's a new person every three days. Influence. We're talking about thinking bigger. I don't know your number, what you thought, but the most introverted, maybe you're not the most introverted. Maybe you're just introverted. How many people are you going to influence in your life? M maybe you're an extrovert. How many people do you think you're going to enter influence in your life. But how about this? Introvert, extrovert, get all that out of the way, Christian. How many people do you think you're going to influence 
in your lifetime. Now, in my Christian walk, I've been privileged enough that, that God has sent me around the world. I've preached the gospel in Europe. I've preached the gospel in Israel. I've gone across the United States and Canada, Mexico with missions and different things that I've done. It's been an honor for me to be able to do that. In all my travels, I've never gone to Asia, never gone to China, and never, honestly, never thought, okay, we're talking about thinking, never thought that my life had an influence in China. In fact, after I traveled with missions for the past, guys, it's almost been 10 years now, I've just been here in SoCal, just doing this thing right here, you know, loving people here at The Rock. That's been my life. And I thought, you know, me in Southern California, we're, we're doing the Inland Empire. This is, this is what we're doing right now, right, God? Okay, we got influence right here in the Inland Empire. I get that. People that God brings in, the people that I, I reach when I'm out there in the community, that sort of a thing. I understand all that, and I, I know all that. And yet, I was standing right over here one night, and somebody came to me, and they said, Pastor Dan, I just came from meeting with one of our missionary friends, and they wanted to share a story with you, and so they asked me if I would share this with you, and I said, okay, well, tell me what's going on. And they said, uh, they're a missionary, and they were missionaries to China. And there in China, they were witnessing to these young adults, and at the time, I was in my 20s, and I was leading our young adults department. And so it's very per perked up my ears. Oh, young adults in China, how, how cool. That's kind of, you know, my thing right now, working with the young adults here at The Rock. And, um, you know, so my ears, my attention, they had my attention. I said, okay, yeah, what, what's up? And they were, they were witnessing to them, telling them that they needed to give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. And as they're telling them this, these young adults in China were sharing with the missionaries. They're saying, no, 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 you don't understand. In our culture, people our age don't make those decisions. We're too young to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. That was their mindset. And so this missionary said, hold that thought. Hold on one second. He went and got their laptop, logged on to rockchurch.com, pulled up a message from the 20-something-year-old pastor at the time who was ministering in this pulpit and said, look at this guy. He's a young adult. He's a pastor preaching the gospel there in Southern California. Why can't you make those decisions? He can make those decisions. Don't you think you could make a decision to follow Jesus Christ? Right there on the spot, they prayed and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, what's the point of the story? I thought I was just doing this. And yet God had a bigger picture. God had a bigger plan. God had influence, not just here, but around the world. What are you doing with your life right now? Taking care of kids? Who knows where those kids are going to go in their lifetime? They may go around the world because you raised them right and be the greatest evangelist the world has ever seen. What are you doing with your life? Are you a plumber, carpenter, handyman, auto mechanic, lawyer, attorney, bank operator? What is it that you're doing with your life? See, we get this vision, we get this narrow vision, and yet God is saying, I want you to lift up your eyes, and I want you to see a bigger picture. I want you to get it in faith, and I want you to get a hold of me, the big God who can dream big dreams with you, share with you the power to do it, and change the world that you live in. Now, let me ask you one more time. Pick a number. How many people do you think you'll influence? I want to end with this verse, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. And the verse goes on to say, to him be the glory and the honor forever and ever. Amen. Tonight, we've got a big God who can do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we could ask or even think. The bigger you think, the greater the power that works in us. Why? Because God will do even more than you could even ask or think. If you got something from the Word tonight, come on, let's give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good. I want to talk to you guys. Thank you guys for remaining put. Everybody else that left was very naughty, and there was a bunch of them. 
Now they all took off, and hopefully they can hear the sound of my voice there in the foyer, in the bathrooms, and out there on the breezeways. And if you can hear my voice, stop right where you're at. Listen up. God wants to speak to you, too, right where you're at right now. I want to ask everybody, please remain seated. Please, nobody get up and walk around during this time. I want to talk to you about something that has eternal importance and eternal significance in your life. It'd be a tragedy if we came into this place like we did tonight, sang songs together, had a good time dancing before the Lord, enjoying some neat, creative things that took place, and the Word of God, you guys were great tonight. Thank you for allowing me to speak that into your life. But it'd be a tragedy if we did all that, came together, and then you walked out of this place after it was all said and done, you left, your heart wasn't right with God, and you died and went to hell. I don't want that to happen to you. You don't want that to happen to you. And listen, God doesn't want that to happen to you. The Bible says that God's unwilling that any should perish, but that all should come to salvation. But the reality is, is that hell's a very real place. Sometimes people say, I don't believe in hell. You know, just don't believe in it. It's not, not real. Listen, the Bible talks about it, Old and New Testament. Jesus talked about it. Therefore, hell's a very real place. And just by saying that something's not real doesn't make it any less a reality that you're going to have to face sooner or later. Come on tonight, let's talk about it. Let's make sure that you don't end up in hell, but that you go to heaven, be with God for eternity. Because hell was never intended for you or I. It was intended for the devil and his angels. And therefore, while we're on this earth, we need to be wise and learn how to get to heaven God's way. Sometimes people say, well, you know, God just lets everybody into heaven. You know, that's why Jesus went to the cross. And, and you get there your way, I'll get there my way. We'll all get there somehow. And, you know, it, 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 whatever you want to do is cool. God's cool with that. And, and everybody will get there somehow. Listen, do you, do you think that God, creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried out in his son Jesus, went through the cross, the suffering of the cross, beaten, bloody mess, Public spectacle for everyone to see. Spit on, beard ripped out, back broken open, thorns in his head. Do you think that he would go through all of that and then just leave it up to whatever you want or I want or some well-meaning church committee decides? No, God tells us exactly how to get to heaven in his word. Doesn't leave it up to you or me. Doesn't leave it up to the church committees. He tells us how in his word. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. So what does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We're going to have to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people hear that and they say, well, I, I, I get that. That's cool because I know that God lets good people into heaven. I've been a really good person lately. I used to be bad. I cleaned up my act. Now I'm good. You know, I, I've done a lot of good deeds. In fact, throughout my lifetime, I've always been nice to my neighbors and gave money to charities. And, and, and you know, I've done a lot of good things in, in, in these latter years of my life. And, and I've been a good person. Therefore, God's looking out, and I've been good enough to get to heaven. Well, let me ask you something. How good do you have to be to get to heaven? Because I don't see any grading scale in the Bible to tell you be this good, and then you get to go. Do this many good deeds or, or any of that kind of stuff. There's no uh, line that you have to be above in the back of the Bible. None of that stuff tells us how good you have to be. Why? Because the standard is perfection if you're going to get there on your own merit. And the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. So you're not going to get there just by being good. In fact, the Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it there by your goodness. Someone needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. And tonight, I'm doing just that, loving you enough to take some time to talk to you about your salvation, where you're at with God. Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Sometimes people say, well, I would go to heaven because, you know, not only have I been a good person, but I was raised in church. Parents took me to church as a child, took me to religious classes like Sabbath school, Sunday school, catechism class, hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck, and, and, and you were baptized or christened as a child, born in America, America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say your parents take you to church, tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you be born in America or that because you're not some other religion, that by default God lumps you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. It simply doesn't work like that. Tonight, come on. Let's love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Sometimes people say, okay, I understand that, but not only when I was a child did I go to church, but here I am in church tonight. I'm sitting in church in front of you right now, and, and, and I consider myself to be a Christian. But, but could you just show that to me in the Bible where it says you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It's not there. It's like saying you could go to your garage, sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. doesn't matter how long you sit there, you're never going to be a car. You're just a person sitting in your garage. 
can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. You say, but, uh, but, but you don't understand. My last church I got involved for a number of years, I sang in the choir, helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even taught in the Bible classes and got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, I'm very glad you did those things. But just, just show that to me in the Bible where that gets you to heaven. You can help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. Or you teach in the Bible classes that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Church involvement doesn't get you into heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible God standing at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. Come on. Let's not play games tonight. It's lovely enough to tell you the truth. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. You're not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, well, I, I get all that, but you know, someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Just celebrated Christmas last month. Sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament, and, 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 and I know God, therefore I'm a Christian. But the problem with that thinking is if you'd read your Bible, you would know that the Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is, can quote scriptures, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So I want everybody to look up at me. Look up at me for a second. Put, put your eyes up here for a second. Look at me. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God, headed for heaven and denying hell. But rather, this is about your heart. Many people will miss God by the distance of just 18 inches. Why? Because God's not interested in what's in your head. He's interested in your heart. Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always been about your heart. God's looking for a heart. Jesus said it like this to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. John, the third chapter, check it out. He, he, he comes to him and he doesn't, they're talking about the same thing we're talking about tonight. And he doesn't pat him on the back and say, hey, man, you were raised in your church. Parents told you you were good, you know, and, and, and you memorized scripture from a young age. Now you can quote it. Now you're one of the leaders. You're just doing a great job, man. Just keep going, and I'll see you in heaven. He doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know a lot of times people turn off when they hear that phrase, being born again, because they've seen it on television and movies and on the internet and books and different media, and they're turned off by it because they see it as weird and, and, and kind of crazy and out there, you know? But it's not about what the world says, media, television, books, internet, movies, any of that stuff. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart, and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with God. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold. Because if I find you warm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, kind of gross. But what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and again. Occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God? Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. When I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again Headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. But get over that embarrassment. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on tonight, a moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell? No, not you. You're too smart for that. The devil's going to try and talk you out of it because he thinks you're dumb. He's going to lie to you and tell you you're, you're going to be afraid. You're gonna, people are going to judge you. Listen, no one in here is judging, criticizing, condemning you. We love you. We want you to do this. We've all done this ourselves. Truth be told, in one way or another, somehow or another, we gave our heart and life to Jesus Christ. And so we're excited for you tonight. But beyond that, Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men... 
I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. You can either push past the embarrassment, give God all your heart and your life, acknowledging your need for Jesus by simply raising your hand. I'll see it all kind of put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than being in hell. Or you can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God. Your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment when you're, if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about your salvation, come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never given God all your heart and life, come on tonight, I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God by simply raising your hand in a safe, friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, you can get your hand up right now. God is watching. Here we go all together on the count of three. I'm going to pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high right now. If that's you, you need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Thank you. There's one right there. There's two. There's three. Thank you. There's four. There's five. Thank you. How many in the family rooms? Three or two? Two? What was I at? Six? Seven? Eight? Nine? Thank you. Got you. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Nine wise people already. I think I got everybody on this side. Anybody over here, you need to give God all your heart and give God all of your life. Nine wise people already. Where are you at? Number 10. Got you right there. Thank you. Number 10, you can put your hand down. Anybody else real quick? Number 11. Got you. Thank you. Is that you? If I didn't already see your hand, there's 11 wise people. Where are you at? Number 12. You're sitting there wondering. You, thank you. Up in the family room, 12 and 13. Thank you. Got you guys. Come on. Come on. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else real quick? Come on, come on, come on. If that's you. You know you need to do this. Thank you. Number 14. Number 15, come on. We're waiting for you. You are waiting for that number five. If that's you, number 15, where you at? Just give me a little wave if that's you. Got you right there. Thank you. Thank you, number 15. Okay, come on. If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you should do it. Right here, got you. Got you. Thank you, number 16. If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you should. Go for it. Go for it. Anybody else real quick? Come on, just pop it up when I'm looking your direction, if that's you. Anybody else? Anybody else in this section? Anybody else over here? About 17 wise people. You guys made me work for it tonight, but that's okay. I'll work hard for you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody back in that family room that we didn't already see? All right, last call. I'm going to close it up. Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 17 wise people. Hallelujah. Now, all 17 of you, or if you're number 18, number 19, number 20, you thought you got away. Uh-uh, not yet. God's still encouraging you. This is what I want you to do at this time. If you raised your hand, you should have raised your hand. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So that, if that's you, you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. Let's all stand and greet them as they come. Welcome them. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on, come on, come on. From the family rooms, you can bring your kids. Bring them on down. From the foyer, come on in. Come on 